Hello everybody, we're Mary Janet and Tom from Ensemble Hesbury and today we're going to chat a bit um, about uh, all sorts of things. Um, many of you have been sending in your questions um, and so we're going to be answering those and um, see where we go from there. So shall I begin with the first question? Okay. Well, who are you? Um, that's fairly easy. Um, <laughs> and what, what are our instruments within yeah. Ensemble Hesbury? So I play the harpsichord in, in Ensemble Hesbury, um, usually this instrument here which comes with us. Um, for concerts. And I'm the recorder player in Ensemble Hesbury, so I play mainly these recorders, there's some others as well, um, and we play with uh, our friends Magda and Florence, and they will be making their own videos, so don't miss, miss out on those. Now what, what about a little bit about our musical careers? So what does your uh, musical life and your career look like when not in <laughs> We're not in lockdown, it's very different. Um, so I do quite a few different things, Hesperi is one of those, so obviously we go around performing concerts um, across the UK and in Europe as well. Um, and I'm also doing a PhD in music, so I'm looking at Scottish musicians in London in the 18th century, so that's really fun. Uh, so that's one another thing I do. I'm also uh, the UK administrator for Buscade, which is a fantastic musical charity based in South Africa. Um, so those are the three main things I do. What about you, Tom? Well, away from the harpsichord, um, I also have a career as a church musician. So um, doing organ playing, solo playing, and also um, choral conducting. And I work um, in two places, at St Mary Le Beau, um, church in the uh, centre of the City of London, where I'm the organist and director of music, and also at the Temple Church London, where I um, mainly work with the choristers there, teaching and also conducting the choir. So that's what I do outside of the harp. So that sounds really. Um, so the next question is, uh, yeah, about our particular instruments. So Tom, you said that this was this is the harpsichord you'd normally use. W what kind is it? Well, this um, is an instrument built by the English harpsichord maker called Alan Gotto, who's based in Norwich. This instrument was built in 2016. So it's actually a fairly new instrument, but it's built upon a copy of an instrument that dates from 1667, a French instrument. We don't actually know the uh, name of the original maker, so it's often known as the anonymous 1667 instrument. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the instrument that I, I play in Ensemble Hesperi. So it's a very good instrument for solo music, but also fantastic as a continual instrument. And it's also pretty easily portable. Yeah, we can um, fit it in our car quite easily. Compared to slightly larger <laughs> so it's, it's a very good all-round uh, instrument. Cool, and um, so f as for me, I play all sorts of different recorders. Um, I've taken a few to show you today. Um, one of my favourite makers, I'll tell you a bit more about later, is Philippe, Le Philippe Lachey. Um, and I have two recorders here of his, a voice flute and a 415 alto. I also have a 440 alto and I think a Renaissance alto by him as well. And then I have a lovely little soprano here by the Japanese maker Takeyama. And um, a new instrument of mine, um, a, a, a soprano, it's called a transitional soprano. And this one is for a late 17th century kind of music and it's by Doris Colossa. Um, so, yeah, these are the kind of instruments I play with Ensemble Hesperi. There are more, but I could spend a long time talking about them, couldn't I, Tom? What's your <laughs> favourite thing about playing Scottish music with Hesperi? Okay, so many of you know, will know that we play a lot of Scottish 18th century music. My favourite thing about this is that I'm Scottish, so I'm from Aberdeen, so for me it feels like coming home when we play this, this kind of music. Um, and. Yeah, I miss Scotland a lot, so it makes me feel as if I can revisit, even when I don't have, you know, it's, it's, it's quite sort of time consuming to go back up, you know, several times so a year, so I, I, it, it makes me feel like I'm at home. What about you? You like, you like playing Scottish uh, I music. I enjoy playing Scottish music. Uh, what do I enjoy about it? Um, I enjoy its kind of honesty. The music has a kind mm -hmm. of honesty to it and um, very beautiful melodies and very infectious rhythms come into this music which are really fun to accompany. And I also enjoy the challenge of coming up with good continuo realisations for this music. <laughs> yes, sometimes it's not always it, easy. Sometimes it's not so easy. Um, and it, it's, it's great fun music to play as an ensemble, to bounce ideas off and do lots of different things with, as well as to interact with the audience and interact with Kathleen, our Highland dancer, as we're performing. So there's a lot of energy in the music that's fun yeah, to work exactly. with. Yeah, exactly. Moving on to your questions. Now, a lot of you have sent in some really, really good questions. We were, some of them, we even had to look up the answer. Mm. So, um, the first one is from Mike. He asks, if you had to choose, 
Which other instrument do you secretly wish you had learned to professional standard? Do you want to start, Tom? I'll start. Um, for me, I think the guitar. Mm, good um, choice. And, um, and also probably because I know that a lot of historical musicians, um, a little bit like I came from the organ to the harpsichord, went go from the guitar to the lute or to the theorbo. Yeah. So for me, um, I'm very interested in continuo, so of course it would still have an interest, it still have mm. the opportunity to do continuo work. But also I find there's a wonderful freedom there that um, I'm really interested in doing. It's, very, it's also a very collaborative instrument, but for the classical guitar there's great repertoire. But also, I'm very interested in musical education. Um, it would be useful to be able to it play the guitar. It would be very useful to be able to play the guitar to go. Um, I once tried to learn it. It's a, I found it very difficult. So I would rather um, I would rather learn percussion. That's one of the coolest mm. things. And if I could if I could be a solo marimba player, that would just be in so cool. I mean, the, the music for solo marimba is incredible. So if you haven't ever heard any solo marimba playing, I would YouTube it immediately. Um, okay, and the next one uh, is Tina from Tina. What other styles and periods of music do you enjoy uh, listening to? Okay, well, I have to admit, I don't really listen to that much classical music. I listen to lots of different things, um, including, um, gosh, just, just really anything. Kind of pop, but not recent pop. Probably more like, I don't know, a bit of 2000s stuff from when we were growing up. Um, and also a wonderful um, uh, singer, songwriter and, and all-round musician, Fife Dangerfield, who has the most incredible um, uh, music on his channels May Change um, site and a fantastic series of 12 episodes called Birdwatcher, which I really do recommend. They are completely mad, all over the place, all kinds of instruments, absolutely everything going on, lots of sampling of, of different sounds and that kind of thing. So th this is what I'm into when I'm not into early music. And you? Okay. Um, for me, away from early music, um, I, I have, I'm very passionate about uh, English Romantic Church music because I do a lot of that and that's what I really kind of grew up on. So I'm very passionate about that music and really, really love to get involved in that. Also love, um, for example, theatre organ music. I'm quite interested in. Oh um, yes, um, it's fantastic. That that's that's great fun and kind of light music. Yeah, which is very fun for playing, that, yeah. for playing on the on the on the organ. And then I don't know, just things that are fun to listen to around the house. It could be from the Beach Boys, for example. Yeah. Oh yes, Beach Boys. You can't really beat the Beach Boys to kind of get you. They're good for doing house house. Good for housework. Too. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, what are your favourite makers of instruments within your own instrument? Or do you want to talk okay, about yeah. that? Okay, yeah. So, so my favourite maker is the French maker Philippe Lachet, um, and I have several of his instruments. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. I would thoroughly re recommend them. Um, they're very, uh, they're voiced in a very open way, so you can you can change the uh, the, the, the the voicing with your um, with your embouchure uh, very easily, um, and therefore you can create dynamics um, as well. He uses the most beautiful woods, um, and his craftsmanship is is beyond incredible. Uh, so he's definitely my favourite maker. Fantastic. What about you with harpsichords? It's well, harpsichords. With harpsichords. Really, I'm, I'm still uh, sort of yes. I mean, I'm, I'm quite settled on my sort of favourite maker. I mean, this I'm very devoted to this instrument by by Alan, <laughs> as I was saying. So, um, was a wonderful in English maker. But for my next instrument, I think I'll probably be looking uh, overseas. So looking forward to exploring more. Yeah, there's lots of lots of wonderful harpsichord makers all across. Europe, yeah. so it's, it's, it's a wonderful craft and wonderful to support and work with lots of makers. Yeah. Now, what about this question, which comes from David? Very interesting one. If you could record the complete works of a composer, um, mm -hmm. whose music would you choose? That's a very difficult question. What do you it's think? It's a very difficult question. I would have to be a violinist for this, probably. Although you can play some of them on the recorder, I'd like to re uh, to record the complete works of um, Pandolfi Miali. Fantastic Stylus Fantasticus composer, um, and uh, this music is just fa very improvisatory, all over the place. Um, most incredible kind of, and, and you know it's brilliant for the continuo as well. Um, and there have been some recordings of the two um, sets of uh, six sonatas that he mm. wrote. Um, but mm. yeah, fantastic stuff. For me, probably I would choose someone like Diet um, Dietrich Buxtehude, um, because. From the, from the organ works, there's some tremendous, incredible pieces of, of organ music, but there's also, um, I mean, I'm taking this, I'm actually taking this question very, very literally, see, 
um, because then you'd also get to record ca wonderful cantatas, wonderful music. Oh yes, everything. Music. You'd have, it would be a very long um, project. That solo so harpsichord music. So that would so yeah, that would be very interesting and uh, that would be my choice. Um, what about this next question um, from Linda, who says it might be quite interesting to hear a bit about how you made the transition from students to professional musicians. Hmm. Would you do anything differently if you had your time again? Ah. Well, first thing to say is that the transition from being a music student to being a professional musician is incredibly difficult. And um, and, and, and what? Clunky. Clunky, yeah. It's, it's kind of, um, it, it's very odd when you leave music college because you've been playing in uh, concerts at music college and everything has been kind of organised for you to some extent. Um, obviously you start to do concerts outside that environment as, uh, towards the end of your degree but it, you know when you sort of end suddenly you do have to find your own opportunities and you have at the same time to pay rent and that kind of thing so there's a lot of different competing pressures. Um, I think I would tell myself to perhaps have a bit more confidence in the fact that I would eventually get there because for two or three years I was having to do a lot of admin jobs which I did enjoy but a lot more of them than I would have liked to do um, just to pay the bills um, and you know it kind of seemed as if that would never end but it definitely you know it really did and then you know things sort of gradually take off but it usually takes at least a few years to really get going um, so yeah, patience would be a good thing, and trying, you know, just trusting a little bit more in my own musical choices as well. Fantastic. Mm. Um, and what about this question, which I think is a fantastic one um, from David? Oh yeah. Who, who's asked another question, which we're happy to answer. Mm -hmm. Fun one. If you could have dinner with a composer, oh yeah, who would you like to meet? Okay, you go first. I'll go first. Um, <laughs> very difficult question, David. I. I've, I was thinking a bit about this earlier today, and I've decided to go for um, the English Baroque composer John Stanley. Mm. Now, organists, of course, know John Stanley because of he wrote a lot of voluntaries and this sort of thing. But for me, uh, having delved a little bit into his life and what he did, um, it would be very interesting to find out about what 18th century London music life was like, especially within churches. Um, because I'm very interested in, in that period. Yeah. And it's a period that we can really identify with now. A lot of the churches are the same there. Yep, um, that's true. Stanley was a temple organist, so you could ask him about what it was like to be at your place at, of work. At my place of work yeah, now. And also, he would have walked the same streets and had lots of stories about um, composers getting jobs, getting commissions. And being successful, having difficulties moving around different churches, and yeah, all about the, the the life and the different people he would have met. So that would be very amazing. fascinating. For me. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think people might disapprove if I don't say James Oswald. So I'm going to say James Oswald. Um, many of you know um, that he's uh, the Scottish Baroque composer that we play the most. Um, but I would be really interested to meet him and have dinner with him, because it would answer a lot of questions which I'm asking in my PhD. <laughs> and it would save me an awful lot of research um, about, you know, why he came to London and what he did there and all this kind of thing. That would be brilliant. Okay, Fantastic. so we now have... A tricky uh, question. A tricky question from Julia. Um, who invented the harpsichord? Well, oh, that's very gosh. difficult. It's very difficult, really, to come up with who invented a lot of instruments, because we because don't really well know. We don't, they kind of merged but, out of other things. Um, but... Basically, a little bit on the very, very early history of the harpsichord. I mean, we have to get a lot of our ideas from pictures. Yeah. Or the occasional description from, and then often from an unusual place, like um, part of a poem or something like this. Yeah, that gives exactly. Us a clue. Nothing. Um, there are early references to the harpsichord around the year 1400, um, though not actually as the harpsichord, but as an instrument which was um, with strings and played with the keyboard. So the keyboard was kind of added on to pluck stringed instruments as another way of playing them. And then an, a very interesting instrument, which I remember very vividly, the, the clavis ethereum. Oh yes, that's now, so cool. Which is actually housed at the Royal College of Music collection, and there's a, there's a modern version of it made, which dates from the same period, a little bit later, but mm, early 1400s. That's a wonderful instrument. And um, I actually had to demonstrate that instrument to, to, um, print, to, it, to, um, to, to the Prince of Wales. To the Prince of Wales. That's, because that was he, a very weird day, wasn't it? When he came <laughs> to visit there, um, I was... Um, on hand to demonstrate some of the instruments in the museum 
and uh, he particularly took a fancy to this instrument and I enjoyed um, playing a couple of um, notes on it. I mean, it's quite di quite a difficult instrument to play because it's very, very different than the harpsichord. These harps, a lot of what we would now think of a harpsichord are kind of coming from, I mean, 17th century, 18th century. So it's a very different type of thing, but that's the kind of, the yeah, other, that's, other cases. Of course, the organ was much older and I suppose there's a link there as yeah, well. Yeah, what I love about the Clavinus Ethereum is it's, it's upright. It's upright. It? It's, so look it's, it up. it's, again, an incredible instrument. It looks like a harpsichord, but smaller, but upright. Crazy. Okay. Um, aha. David asks um, about, so his question is about um, whether we can play all kinds of music on Baroque, on period instruments. So, for example, I don't know, the Beatles, Shostakovich, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. I mean, yes, I, I, I'm not a purist by any means. I don't think you should just play... Um, the, the music appropriate to the period on, on each instrument. But um, I think there are some sort of constraints regarding uh, sounds and that kind of thing. So if you wanted to play a Shostakovich symphony, uh, for example, you'd have problems, really. <laughs> the harpsichord has got quite an interesting modern self. Yeah, with exactly. A lot of and of, so who does the recorders? So for our instruments, that's fine. I and mean, you can arrange anything for. I mean, we know from so many of you um, playing recorder ensembles, where I'm sure you've played fantastic arrangements of, of pop songs and, and all sorts of music. And um, so yeah, I, I don't think there should be many rules about this kind of thing. Yeah. The next question is how often and how do you tune the harpsichord? Ah, well, very good question. Um, basically, each string on the harpsichord um, is, is one note on one on one uh, stop so um there are just here some what are called tuning pins and this is just a, a little bit of metal about this long and the end of the string is wound around that and this hammer here um just fits onto the top of the um tuning pin and then you turn it to make the string looser or more tight, and that changes the pitch. And how do you decide, how do you know what pitch it should be? Do you listen or do you...? Um, well, I in basically use a, a, just some point of reference. I mean, I tend to just use the an A that comes from my app on my phone. You could yeah. use, you or, could use a, a... A tuning um, fork? Yeah. A tuning fork. And exactly. that gives you that, that gives you the point of reference that we're using And then now. you use various different systems and, to tune. And then you use different you systems um, to tune. Um, how often depends on kind of whether, <laughs> how temperamental the instrument's feeling. Every instrument has its own kind of feel. Yeah. And also, Likes different also according to not. their age as well, and how the wood is and humidity. So, and also depending on what you what we've got going well, on. Oh yes, so, I mean if you're not going, if you don't need to record or it or practice something for a, a, a concert or whatever, and you're just practicing yourself, unless it's sounding really terrible, you probably wouldn't make a big effort to tune it. You know, unless it really needed it, if it had, if it was sort of stable since the last time. Yeah. Okay. okay. What's our next question? Who was the first composer Ooh. to specify the recorder in composition? Indeed, I had to look this up. Interesting, tricky question. Yeah, the first mention of a recorder in a composition was only in 1621, or oh. at least after 1621, by Giovanni Battista Riccio. Um, and he specified um, one of his canzones for being for two, uh, two flautino. A small recorders. Um, the reason why it's so late is because before that, and indeed for quite a lot of the 17th century, people tended not to write um, what instrument um, a piece was for on the front of the piece. You just had to kind of work it out or maybe it didn't matter. Um, so although there was obviously plenty of music played on recorders before that point, it wasn't specifically said that it was for recorder. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, for Mary Janet, Again, about tuning and things. Oh, yes. Which temperaments are your recorders, if in if there are several different ones, and which you, do you prefer to play? In? Okay, so um, equal temperament is useless for recorders, which is an interesting one. Um, and very few makers, uh, professional makers, will make instruments in equal temperament unless you actually ask them to. They prefer not to, and the reason is because um, you get a lot more sweetness and character from an, an unequal temperament. Um, so you've got lots of choices of temperaments, just like for the harpsichord. Um, a lot of recorder makers will use Velotti as a nice even kind of temperament, or Young. And it's easy to use and practically. It's easy, and it's easy to use practically as well, because obviously you don't want to end up with a temperament that's very difficult to play with harpsichords and other people. Um, 
For earlier instruments, Renaissance instruments, um, some makers will make in mean tone, uh, which is an, uh, an even more uneven temperament. Now that I do like, but you have to sort of make sure that the harpsichord is also in mean tone and that you're kind of working from the same uh, pitch root. So it's quite complicated to play in mean tone, but when you do, it's really cool. It sounds really sort of edgy and, and all of the harmonies sound even more extreme when they're extreme and even more beautiful when they're beautiful. Mm, fantastic. Yeah. Next question. Okay, um, next question. Oh, this is for you, Tom. Um, what is your view on harpsichords in the earlier 20th century style before historically informed harpsichord making started? So, I mean, I hadn't heard of these before and we looked um, at them online. Yeah, incredible. I mean, fantastic. And of course, very very many fantastic players nowadays it's very easy to see some amazing um early pioneer players playing yeah. um and also on some very interesting uh, instruments i mean as far as the playing is concerned absolutely incredibly inspiring often very very kind of very very varied, can be very tender, but also very muscular and powerful. Yeah, in, and it's funny because the harpsichords, they look a bit more like pianos, they don't really sound yes, like Yes, and their touch would have been extremely different, much yeah. deeper than, than, for example, on this one, often the key doesn't go down quite But the quite players, are, I mean, it's, it's a lot of black and white film that you can find on YouTube, it's, it's if you sort of search some people playing the 1920s, it's very different. It's just, it's just different, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's cool that they did it. Someone like Van der Landowska is a very incredible player to watch. Um, very committed and fiery playing, um, but also very tender, mm. uh, particularly in her piano playing. So, yeah, very inspiring and interesting, and we're lucky to be able to see these these players, thanks yeah, to clips yeah. and things online now. Yeah. Um, MJ, how is your instrument different from modern versions? Okay, so um, that's interesting because, of course, some of my instruments, well, all of my instruments, are modern versions of Baroque and Renaissance style instruments. So that's a good start. Obviously none of my instruments are 18th century, they tend to de deteriorate quite quickly over time. Um, so the ones that we do have are used as models and kept as museums. Um, makers measure them and then copy them, so mine are copies. But then there's also other types of recorders which are more modern in general. So for example you have um, Edrina Broekink who developed the Eagle recorder, which is um, uh, an ultra recorder but with a much bigger range and dynamic possibilities so uh so it can play as part of an orchestra um and there's a fantastic instrument you also now get electronic recorders of various different kinds i've not found one that's sort of satisfying as yet but it's a real it's a really interesting idea so yeah you you do get differences and now a scottish question do you believe mm. that James Oswald and Neil Gow might have inspired each other? Okay, so um, I think probably they would have known of each other. Um, Neil Gow was um, uh, an amazing fiddler in Edinburgh, well, per no, Perthshire, I think, actually, um, part of the Gow family, uh, famous Gow family in the 18th century. And he, um, he would have started uh, performing and working as a musician just as James Oswald was leaving for London. Um, and then James Oswald, as far as we know, never returned to London. So I have a feeling that their paths might have slightly not crossed. However, um, Neil Gow would have undoubtedly known of Oswald's publications because they were published in Edinburgh as well as in London, um, his Caledonian Pocket Companion, um, and with the many Scots tunes. So they were both kind of in the same area. Um, obviously, Neil Gow was more... Uh, geared towards dance um, and and Oswald certainly more towards instrumental music but I think they would have definitely known mm. of each other of, for sure. A lot of people and cross collaborations which we don't necessarily know we about don't, documentation We can't really now. sort of know. It's, it's a, um, that's an interesting thing. And what's, now Tom, yeah. Yes, what's your, my favourite temperament? Your favourite temperament, yeah. Um, okay. Well the temperament I first learnt to tune was uh, it's the Kernberger oh, temperament. Yeah, I forgot about and that. that's a very good one I was taught um, to to uh, learn tuning from because it's quite a good one to learn um, quarter comma uh, distance of, of um, tempering the fifth. Um, so that's one that I really like. Also, it's fantastic um, for playing solo music because it has a lot of uh, quite interesting... Uh, yeah, interesting intervals come from yeah, that. And yeah, and lots of colour in the harmony. But actually, of course, mean tone temperaments are very inspiring to play for, particularly for a lot of slightly early music, for playing Frascobaldi Toccatas, for example. It's really fantastic to play in the meantime. It just kind of tells you how to play. It tells you 
which notes you should dwell more on or a little bit on tempo even you can sort of get the sense of exactly what um what mm -hmm. you should be doing with a piece so yeah those are two that i particularly like cool and the last fun question is has anything odd or strange happened to us on stage mm. um well the strangest thing that's probably happened to me is when i i once had pins and needles in oh. my hands, had to, which, which was very horrible, and had to actually stop the concert. But that's only because <laughs> that's it happened. Once. But that was a very strange thing. It to was happen. very strange. I remember. And, um, when, yeah. What, what about for you? Well, when I I don't get it so much, but when I was younger and more anxious performing. I used to get hiccups, which was very unhelpful when you're a wind player, and you'd have I'd have to sort of take a breath and kind of go, oh, and that you know, and then continue. I'm having to miss a bar or two, so that that's that challenge. yeah, it's not great, but it doesn't really happen anymore, Fantastic. so that's good. But I know that Mag just got a great answer to that yeah, question, Mag so we hope so... you will tune in and uh, see some questions be answered by Florence and by Magda yeah, in the coming weeks. Yeah, absolutely, in the coming weeks. So see you soon, and do join us for our Friday live stream concerts. Thank you. Bye-bye.